Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the function of synaptic tagmin. So, so far we are discussing how synaptic vesicles dock at the plasma membrane. So we've discussed how uh, you form this core snare complex out of these four, oh, sorry, three snare proteins, synaptic brevin 2, SNAP25, and syntaxin 1. Now, what I want to discuss with you is a bit of more terminology because you will often hear people refer to uh, synaptobrevin 2 as what is known as an R snare. Okay? An R snare. And you will hear people refer to uh, syntaxin 1 and SNAP25 as Q snares. Okay? So Q snares. And I want uh, you to understand what these mean because they are not just some other way of writing V-snare and T-snare. Okay, what these refer to is amino acids that are in these proteins, basically. So, there is a portion, there is a portion of each of these uh, proteins, synaptobrevin 2, SNAP25, and syntaxin 1, where you have ionic interactions, basically, between the three, four alpha helices, okay? So, when they form this core snare complex, what happens is that at a, at a certain point along this core snare complex, the four alpha helices are going to interact with each other in an electrostatic manner, so they don't just intertwine, you also have this bonding between them at a certain point of the core snare complex. Okay, and we, I'm not going to draw it down there, ignore that line that I've drawn there, I'm going to write its name down here. Okay, so this portion, actually I will use this line, this portion here, with this long arrow, is known as the zero ionic layer. So the zero ionic layer. Okay, and let me now discuss which amino acids is in all four of these alpha helices which is, are interacting with one another. Basically, the reason the synaptobrevin is called an R snare is because the amino acid it contributes into this zero ionic layer is an arginine, the single letter amino acid code for which is R. Okay, whereas the other two um, snare proteins SNAP25 and syntaxin 1, they all contribute Q, glutamine, okay? And SNAP25 has two alpha helices, so both of the alpha helices of SNAP25 contribute glutamine into this zero ionic layer. So, let me discuss with you the structure of arginine and glutamine, and then we might be able to understand what's happening between these uh, snare proteins. Okay, so arginine then, the harder one. So if we start with our amino terminus up here, here is our alpha carbon, and here's our carboxylic acid group down here, then the R group of arginine is that you have three methylene groups here, like so, all with hydrogens off. Let me just finish the drawing of these. And then after these three methylene groups here, you then have a nitrogen bound here with a hydrogen off it. A carbon follows with an amino group up here, NH2. And then you have a double bond down to a nitrogen here with a hydrogen off it. This nitrogen with the double bond is known as a guanidino nitrogen. So this is called the guanidino nitrogen. Guanidino nitrogen. Okay. And it basically has a lone pair of electrons exposed here. So here's its lone pair of electrons. Now, that lone pair of electrons, electrons have negative charge. So they attract a proton, basically, which has a positive charge. So a proton often comes and associates with this head of arginine's R group, basically. So it overall means that the arginine amino acid is going to get a positive charge because it's going to have this proton associated with it. So this is the amino acid structure of arginine. And the single letter amino acid code for arginine is R. Hence, R snare. Okay, now let me show you uh, the amino acid structure for glutamine. So again, we have our amino group here. Do it down here. Then we have our alpha carbon here with a hydrogen off it. 
a carboxylic acid group down here, okay, and then what you effectively have is propanoic acid sticking off the side. So a free carbon carboxylic acid group sticks off the side. So here's our carboxylic acid right at the end, and here are hydrogens. Now, this, strictly speaking, is the structure of glutamic acid rather than glutamate. So what's the difference between glutamic acid and glutamate? Uh, oh, sorry, when we're not actually talking about glutamic acid, though. We're talking about glutamine. Cross this out. Put this a big cross through this. We're actually talking about glutamine. So take this hydroxyl group off and add an amine group on. Then you've got glutamine. I do apologize for that. Got a little carried away. Glutamine, then. So glutamine is the um, amide, the primary amide that you form from glutamic acid. Okay, so this is the structure of glutamine. Now, you might say, oh look, we've got a nitrogen here with a lone pair of electrons presumably on it. Surely it can associate with a proton as well and give the molecule a positive charge. To which I would reply, study chemistry. The nitrogen of amide bonds like this very rarely gets protonated. It's really, really difficult to protonate the, amino, uh, the nitrogen um, in the amino group of an amide group like this. You have to put it in very, very acidic conditions which just aren't physiological. So um, for our purposes, glutamine is not going to get protonated. And instead, Oxygen and nitrogen have very high electronegativities, uh, which means that they um, attract electrons, basically. So let me discuss this in a bit more detail. So in these bonds between the carbon and the nitrogen and the carbon and the oxygen, there are electrons that are being shared by the carbon and the oxygen. Okay, so in a single bond, the carbon will donate one electron and the nitrogen will donate one electron, like so. Okay, so these electrons are being pulled by the nucleus of the carbon atom and also by the nucleus of the nitrogen atom because the nuclei are positively charged. That's where the protons are. Okay, now the nitrogen atom, what it means to say that the nitrogen atom has a higher electronegativity than the carbon is that the nucleus of nitrogen pulls these electrons harder than the nucleus of the carbon. So, saying something has a higher electronegativity means that the nucleus pulls on electrons great more than the nucleus of the other chemical species. So, nitrogen has a greater electronegativity than carbon. So, these electrons, they spend more time around the nitrogen than they do around the carbon. Similarly, oxygen has a greater, much greater electronegativity than carbon. So it, it, these electrons in this double bond, they're going to spend more of their time around the oxygen. This means that the oxygen gets a partial negative charge, the nitrogen gets a partial negative charge, and the carbon, it gets a partial positive charge. So the end bit of the glutamine has a partial negative charge here. So what happens? Why is this important for snare proteins? Well, basically, if I draw these four snare proteins here, the alpha helices of these snare proteins, let's say this is the alpha helix of our synaptor brevin 2, okay? It contributes this arginine amino acid to the uh, zero ionic layer, okay? Now let's draw the alpha helices of the other, um, other snare proteins. So here are the two alpha helices of our SNAP25, in turquoise, and here is the alpha helix of our syntaxin 1. Okay, all three of these contribute glutamine, so we'll denote those in Q. So Q for glut is the single letter amino acid code for glutamine. Okay, this is why they are called Q snares. The arginine has a positive charge at the end of it. These glutamines, as I've discussed, have these net partial negative charges. That's how you get an electrostatic interaction between those two. And that contributes to the um, holding together of these um, four alpha helices of these snare proteins. Okay, right. Now, you don't just form one of these core snare complexes here. You form multiple. And to make the picture nicely symmetric, people usually draw two. So, we'll draw another one here to get that point across. So here's another core snare complex. So in turquoise here, we have our SNAP25 
contributing to alpha helices. In blue here, we have our syntaxin 1, contributing a single alpha helix. And in orange, we have our synaptobrevin 2 protein. Now, these alpha helices, as I've said, they bind together through this zero ionic layer. They also spin around one another to form this sort of like zippering up um, mechanism. Okay, so what happens is these gradually zipper up, and as you can imagine, that's going to bring the membrane of the plasma, uh, of the cell rather, uh, closer and closer to the, well, it's going to bring the membrane of the vesicle closer and closer to the membrane of the cell. So it's going to keep these very nice and close together. Now, it does not cause them to fuse. And we'll discuss later why the Rothman assay, which showed that this did cause them to fuse, was wrong. Okay, we'll discuss that later. But it doesn't cause them to fuse. They, it causes them to dock. This is the complex which docks them at the membrane um, that faces onto the postsynaptic cell. Okay, right. So we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video we'll discuss the mechanism by which you actually complete this process and get the fusion of the uh, synaptic vesicle with the presynaptic membrane.